fancy plaiting. I think it's one of the primary ways we can push the artistic aspect of wit making to its limits. In this episode, we'll explore the basics of complex braiding and a revolutionary tool that's helped myself along with so many others take the very first steps into the world of fancy plaiding. Hey everyone, it's Nick with The Whip Shop. This episode is sponsored by Snappy Press, where I got this custom shirt made. And there are a lot more custom shirts just like this available now at nickswhipshop.com. Guys, if you're looking for a reliable t-shirt screen printing company, look no further than Snappy Press. They have the fastest turnaround time of any t-shirt printers, and these are the most comfortable shirts you can imagine. So many times when you order a custom-made shirt with your logo on it from a company online, they focus on your logo, but they don't care much about the quality of the shirt itself, and that's so important. A lot of people will wear that shirt just because it's got their logo on it, but it's not comfortable. Over at Snappy Press, they focus not only on your design, but they also pay close attention to the quality of the shirt. They helped me come up with a color scheme that would work with water-based ink so the print is really soft, and they didn't charge me extra for that. They also have free shipping and no setup fees. As a matter of fact, if you guys order within the next 30 days and mention my name, Nick's Whip Shop, you can get $100 off your first order. So check them out. Fancy plaiting. Ever since I started making whips back in 2011, I was always aware of fancy plaiting, particularly seen on whip handles. So this matched set of five foot stock whips here, this is kind of the furthest extent of my fancy plaiting. Um, compared to a lot of other whip makers, this is not fancy at all, but it's fun. So back in the day, if you wanted to create a fancy pattern design, you literally had to take graph paper and plot out all of your little squares where the strands would be and you'd have to color them in and label. You would have to determine which strands are going over and which strands are going under to develop your pattern. But now you don't have to do that anymore because of a very generous man by the name of Mike Icon who has created the Faceplat computer program. If you go to whipinfo.com slash faceplat, which we're getting ready to look at here in a minute, uh, you can see that there is a wonderful template already set up. All you have to do is take your mouse and click in the little squares of what you want your pattern to be, and the computer program itself will tell you the sequences of what strands go where, under, over, etc. Now there's two main methods that we can use to create a fancy plaiting pattern. One is taking your first color, your eight strands, if you're in 16 plat, and spiraling all of them around your handle first. Then taking your secondary color, threading a needle into each one of them, and then weaving your pattern in. And as a matter of fact, Connor Hack of Caliber Whips has an excellent video showing this method, so check that out. Link in the description. I tried that method once and I was really put off at how long it took and how complicated it was. I didn't have enough threading needles so I think I rigged up some brass tubing to where uh, I could sort of have them work as needles but I didn't like that method. It took so long and uh, I think it was a 10 foot whip that I made and there's a little video of it right there as you can see it's a very sloppy whip. So after I made that whip. I didn't touch fancy plaiting again for a few years, mostly because I was intimidated and I didn't want to use the spiral method and I also just didn't know how to start. So a few years back I got the opportunity to see some beautiful whips made by Peter Thorndike when I was visiting Adam Winrich. I saw these beautiful 64 plat handle stock whips and I said to myself, man, I want to do this. Not necessarily this, you know, this intricate yet. but. I want to at least get back into fancy plaiting. I want to learn an easier, more effective way. And this, in my opinion, is a much more effective way. Today, we're going to be designing from scratch in face plait a fairly simple pattern. And we're going to then bring the computer over here and work through that pattern in real time and build a beautiful fancy plaited whip handle. If you guys are new to the channel, I would greatly appreciate it if you'd reach down there and hit that subscribe button. Also like, comment, share with your friends. It really helps the channel. In addition to that, if this channel has helped you over the years with your whip making, 
I would greatly appreciate it if you would head over to patreon.com slash nickswhipshop where you can give a little bit per month, whatever you feel you've gotten out of the channel. So let's step over to the computer and take a look at this awesome program. All right, so let's head over to the Faceplat website. It's going to be whipinfo.com slash faceplat. <clears throat> and here's what we see as soon as we arrive at the website. Now let's take a second and talk about what we are looking at here because when I first started doing fancy plaiting, I was really confused. I didn't know what I was looking at exactly. This right here is the same as looking at a world map on the wall. The world map portrays a round globe uh, because we are looking at it uh, on a two-dimensional piece of paper on the wall, all of the continents are on one side. The same thing applies here. Uh, all of your pattern you're seeing at once, where in reality, uh, if we look at the left side here, the, the light gray represents 180 degrees of that handle, and the dark gray side here represents the other 180 degrees. So two of those together uh, added together equals the whole circumference of that 360 degree whip handle. So it's really important to understand that. A lot of times people will open this program up and they'll start writing this uh, name here. They'll start with a big pattern that comes across the whole thing and they'll expect to be able to read that on their finished product, the whip handle, where in reality that's not the case. Uh, they may successfully execute the plotting out of the squares and, and plot it in such a way that it would really be there, but you would have to rotate that whole whip around just to sort of be able to uh, read it a little bit. So really pay attention to that when you are designing your pattern. In reality, if you decide, for example, here that you want to have a pattern on this side, this is kind of pushing it because we're from this tip here to this tip here, that's 180 degrees. That's the whole side of your handle. So kind of be conscious of that when you are um, building your patterns. And that's something still that I'm getting familiar with. I'm no pro at this. I'm learning right along with you guys. And I'm just really thankful that Mike was uh, kind enough to make this program because it's really helped me a lot. So let's go ahead and get started here at the top right. Let's click on these tabs here and then we'll bring up the different sections of the website. So we have project settings, start braiding, reset clear, and we'll talk about these different uh, different pages here. But first let's go to the project settings. Now this is where we have the ability to manipulate the number of rows along with the plat number of our whip. Uh, as you can see conveniently here we are in a 16 plat that's uh, actually going to be the plat number of the whip we're going to be working on today in this video eight on the left eight on the right obviously if you wanted to you could do 32 strands on the left 32 on the right for a 64 plat handle uh, so you this this is a very powerful tool it has the option to do that so that's really it's nice to have that option I'm nowhere near that yet but maybe someday. So let's take it back to a um, oops. Let's take it back to a more realistic plat number, uh, which is 16, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, moving down, we have the colors, and it's really nice because you can change the colors and make it accurate to the whip you're making. So on the left side, I'm actually going to change this. I'd like to see something like a nice bright red, and on the right side. We'll go ahead and change this. Um, I'd like actually a light gray, the same colors of the whip from the stock whip tutorial. We'll go with that. I think those two colors are pretty easy to see. So once we have the colors we want, we hit apply settings, and boom, there you go. There you have it. We have on the left our gray, and on the right we have our red. So let's go ahead and just start making a pattern. We're going to start with a single strand diamond, under one over one, under one over one, etc. You guys, uh, you guys know the pattern, um, but it's really helpful to be able to understand 
and kind of predict what a pattern is going to look like when we're looking at the whole 365, 365, 360 degree. Where did that five come from? Sorry about that. So it's really nice to be able to understand what patterns look like um, on the whip itself once it's done versus this, um, this guide here, this blueprint. So I'm going to fill in a diamond pattern. And the beautiful thing about this is that the program is doing all the work for you. I'm not even worried right now about what goes under and what goes over. And there are different patterns that will work and that will not work. And we'll talk about that in just a second here. And there we have a diamond pattern. So I'm going to just do a little stair step, as they call it. Some people call it bands. Um, it's just a solid color that wraps around the whole handle. So if we look at this little red tip here on the right side, when we take this thing, cut it out, and wrap it and fit it together, this little red tip here will plug in right here. So this missing spot here is essentially where this part is going to plug in. And when we pay attention to our spacing, uh, that is a very helpful tool that will help us decide what will work symmetrically and what won't work. So next, what I'm going to do is I have this little band of red here, and I'm just going to go ahead and do a band of gray right below it just to make things even. And then we'll start our pattern underneath that. It's going to take a second to remove these. We have room. OK, so we have some more room to work with now. I've started with a diamond. I went into this little stair step pattern here in red, then one in gray, once again in red. And now I'm going to go ahead and start my pattern, kind of the, the epicenter of this whole um, handle. And I'm just going to do that by creating two squares. And I'll keep the middle open like that. So right now as it is, this is taking up one half of the handle approximately. And I'm going to make sure that I have one free space here in between these two squares. So if we had the finished whip, it would look like this. If we had it laying on the table, this square would be pointing straight up. It would be on the, the exact top. And then this part would be right underneath it opposite. And let's talk about the spacing again because it is important. Notice here between the right side of our square here and the left side of the square here, we have one gray block open. And also, if we look at the edges here, we have the same thing going on, but it's harder to detect because it's going on at the seam. And a lot of the times you might be working on a pattern and it's going to be tricky. I'm still learning this myself. I'm still learning to recognize uh, a pattern that's resting upon a seam because that's what's going on right here. Notice we have an open space here. This is going to be plugged in right here. So yes, in fact, we do have a space in between here in gray and another space in between here. And it's so much easier to visualize this if we were to cut this out and fold it in half and tape those corners together. So let's go ahead and make this thing a little bit more intricate. I'll just add a downward pointing arrow and I'll do the same here. I'm making this symmetrical. Notice I have I have one space in between all of these. So if I wanted to do this here, what could I do to make this kind of an infinite pattern that wraps around the handle? Well, I need to put a couple more of these arrows in. So where would I do it? Well, look at here. We have one spot here. Notice this is a pattern that is resting directly on the seam, so it's going to be a little bit tricky. This is what I'm going for, this little downward pointing arrow. So I have one piece of it here, and then right here, there is where it would be. And notice there is one space here, one here, one space, one space, 
and this is where the fold is. So learning to recognize that uh, is a little bit time consuming and it takes repetition. So to hopefully give you guys a better understanding about this whole 360 degree business, I've actually taken the pattern that we're going to be doing today and I've cut it out. I also have here a brass rod or brass tube and I'm just going to wrap it around here just like this and I want to show you how those ends, those tips that we were talking about, I want to show you how they match up just like that and it creates your 360 degree pattern. So you can see the little tip we were talking about earlier plugs into the other side. And then some of our other patterns that we could only see half of, for example, those little arrows, notice right there, that little tab slides right in. And that's a better, hopefully a better illustration of the whole 360 degree concept of your pattern. If you're ever unsure as to whether or not a pattern will work, cut it out. Do what I did here, take an X-Acto knife, cut it out, and wrap it around a tube like this. And this is a good way that you can get some foreshadowing going on. You can actually see what your pattern is going to look like and make sure that it's symmetrical. If you're confused about it, this is a great exercise to follow through with. Hope that clarifies things. So now we want a upward pointing arrow. I want one here. So it would go there. There's uh, one third of that little arrow. So then going to the other side, there is the other two thirds of it. So now we have that. And now I'm going to go back into my stair step in red, my little red band that goes around the handle. Oops. And then we'll have one in gray. I'm just going to eliminate these real quick, get them out of my way. And then we will have also a band in gray and one more in red. And then we'll go right back into our single strand checkerboard, AKA diamond pattern. So that's symmetrical. See that? That looks good. Starting with the diamonds, three bands. Here's our main center of attention here. And then back into these guys. And then lastly, we'll go back into our diamond pattern. And then we'll hit the start plaiting button, which is really cool. And I think we'll just finish up this row here. And that is good enough for this illustration. So I have a pattern I really like, and I've made my measurements here, and everything works well. It is a consistent pattern. I like it. What do I do next? Well, I would recommend you go up to the tab here on the top right and hit the Save Design slash Share button here. Click on that. And this is a really awesome thing that Mike has built into version two of this program. It says here, you may link to this design using the URL. So here, let's copy this URL. Copy it. And I would recommend saving it in either a Word document or a note, a clip, clip pad, clipbook, whatever text app you have on your computer save it and label it because at any given moment you can open a new tab take that URL plug it in boom there's your pattern you can resume working on it you can change something and it's preserved now that's a great thing to do um, <clears throat> saving it we will go ahead and go back to the main menu here um, but what can you do next we're, we're ready to go I have it saved for safety and let's start plaiting it. You grab your laptop, carry it over to your workbench where you're working on your whip, and you say, I want to start. Okay, well, let's start braiding. This is awesome. Notice here on the top left, the sequence is highlighted. Now, back in the day when you had to take graph paper and draw these patterns out, you had to literally cross off the left side, cross off the right side, and you had to write in the sequence for every single strand. It's very time consuming, very difficult. 
and Mike made this program so that you don't have to do that anymore and you can just click along here next next notice notice that it's shifting from left to right and it's alternating and we can just literally work our way right down this whip and it highlights it for you so you don't lose your spot that's awesome I love that so let's go back up to the top here so say okay we're starting with the left hand side now whenever you are seeing a highlighted sequence on the left side there we're pulling strands from the right side and a lot of you probably remember that from my bird's eye plat video the working strands are actually coming from the opposite side and that's something that you need to remember it can be a little confusing at first but once you get the hang of it it makes sense so under one over one this strand is going to be laid out here we're grabbing a strand from the right side we're carrying it around the back and then that action is being carried out that sequence here highlighted is being carried out right here same with the right side if the right side is highlighted we're grabbing a strand from the left carrying it around the back and carrying out that sequence that's currently highlighted also it's good to mention that if you're going to be doing fancy plaiting like this uh, your results will be best if you have your colors split down the middle meaning that all of the strands on the left side if you're doing 16 plat all strands on the left side all eight of them have them a solid color for example red and on the right side have those a solid color different from red so red and gray you could do yellow and blue whatever you want just have them split down the middle and that is the most ideal setup for doing uh, any fancy plaiting so we found this to be a symmetrical pattern that works all of the spaces are even between all of these little patterns you see here uh, we're kind of examining this here these two little lines here are in fact these identical patterns but they are resting on the seam there and that's why they're broken in half there so we have two squares one two and we have a total of four little arrows two pointing down two pointing up let's kind of talk about what it would look like if you designed a pattern that wouldn't work what does a pattern look like that doesn't work and that's not symmetrical let's just go ahead and get rid of what we have don't worry I have the pattern saved so we can just with the uh, control V we can bring it right back up so don't worry don't lose sleep at night <laughs> So I'm just going to get rid of our pattern here and let's talk about something that wouldn't work. So okay, I'm going to go here, here. So this is a really big pattern. This is sitting on about 180 degrees of the whip. So we'll do this, we'll join it here. Right there. Now notice this. Um, if you can see here this is a pattern that wouldn't be even because we have nothing dividing this in half here and then if we look up here this here if we look up here this space is going to be where this gray is so the pattern would work but it wouldn't be symmetrical and maybe that's maybe you don't care about that that's fine so we can do something like this And we can kind of count the spaces in between here. So in between this one and this one, we have one, two. And in between this one and this one, we have only one space. So this is an example of a pattern that if you cut this out and folded it together, it wouldn't be even. Like I said, I'm kind of a man of symmetry. I, I, I like things to be symmetrical, especially in my whip design. So this would be something that I wouldn't be too keen on doing. Um, so that that's an example of something that's uneven I really hope this makes sense I I'm maybe not the best at explaining it because I'm not currently uh, that 
used to doing this. I'm learning it right along with you. So hopefully there'll be a, a more positive outcome from that because hopefully we'll be kind of uh, stumbling over the same uh, areas because we're both learning this together. Whereas if someone sat down here and explained this to you guys, someone who had a, a background of doing this for 10 years, they might skip over things that they forgot were challenging in the beginning. So I think learning this along with you guys uh, will actually be beneficial for both you and me because I'm kind of learning things as well as I go through this process with you and uh, just kind of explaining it is helping me. So I hope you guys are understanding this. If you want me to go over this again uh, slower, hit the uh, 0.5 times speed on the, no, I'm just kidding. I would be happy to go over this again because this is, an, this is a journey for me and I do plan on doing more of these videos um, in the future. So guys, this very pattern that we just set up here, um, let's go over to the workbench, let's grab the laptop, and let's just start working on it right now and see what we come up with, see how it turns out. All right, so here is a look at the whip that we are going to be working on for this video. This is gonna be about a five foot nylon bull whip. As you can see, it's going to have an off colored handle. This is where our fancy plaiting is going to go. So we're going to get this thing in the clamp and then we will get our strands together and begin. All right, so I have the whip in the clamp up on my screen. I have my pattern all ready to go. We're getting ready to hit the start plating button. But first, let's just talk about these prepped strands. So first of all, if I measure my handle, you'll notice it's about eight and a half to nine inches. So what I've done was I've taken eight strands of my gray and each of these gray strands are double the length of the handle that I want to plait over. It's kind of the general rule I like to follow with parachute cord. If I have an area I want to plait over, I double the length. So you'll see that the gray strands, all eight strands go double the length and also all of the red strands go double the length. As you can see there, and all of the strands are split down the middle, meaning the left is one color and the right is another color. So I am considering each of these to be, when I say one strand, here's two strands, three, I'm considering these each to be one strand. So I basically have eight folded strands. Now let's talk about how we are going to set up our pattern. Now this is something that's sometimes a little bit tricky and it seems counterintuitive. So do you remember when we were selecting the colors on the left and on the right? So after we did that, we selected, we had red on the left and we had gray on the right. But then when we hit enter, we noticed that our pattern showed the opposite. So this is something that you need to remember. So this little tab here where we decide what's on the left and what's on the right, uh, that is specifically what we see when our strands are lying out on the left and the right, and it's what we see before we begin plaiting. So we wanna get our red strands on the left side. So to do that, we're gonna do what we've done for just about every other video on this YouTube channel. We're gonna go around the back, starting off with the red in my right hand, and I'm going to fold the red over the gray like that. And once again, I'm making sure with my index finger that the joined sections melted together are directly behind the handle. At this point, I can take my remaining strands and I'm going to be finding all of the red ends like this. And I'm going to open up an eye like that, slide those red strands through. We can close that eye and one by one we can pull those strands through until the melted joined sections stop us. Pull gently. Sometimes those little melted sections will still find their way through. So let's make sure that nothing was interrupted here and nothing was scattered around because that can happen. I'm still feeling on the backside after we've closed up that 
eye. As you see things have shifted around just a little bit. We want to get it as close as we can. And there we have eight strands of red on the left and, and eight strands of gray on the right. And we can begin now. Okay, we are ready to go. We have all of the red on the left side and all of the gray on the right side. If we pan the camera up, we can see that I have the pattern. Notice I've made a few very small changes just because I think it'll make things easier. I had a, a free flowing strand that went across about six or seven strands. And I think that'd be really confusing, especially for starting off with. So that one in the middle is gonna tack it down so it's not moving around nearly as much. So the pattern is a little bit different than what you saw me putting together uh, initially. So now I can go up here to the top right, click on little tabs, and then go over to the top left, and I can go ahead and hit start braiding. And there it comes to life. I'm gonna make this bigger for you guys. Nice and big, we can see that very easily. And the whole pattern is here. We'll just scroll down as we need to. But So we can see here at the top left, the first pattern is highlighted in yellow. And remember, whenever there is a pattern, a sequence highlighted on the left side, we're taking a strand from the right side, bringing it around the back, and carrying out that sequence. So, let us begin. We're going to be in a diamond plait for a few passes here. So on the upper left, we see our sequence highlighted. That means we're taking a gray strand from the upper right around the back. And you guys know the drill for this pattern. Under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over. This is the standard single strand diamond plait that you've seen illustrated many times on this YouTube channel. So don't overthink that. And now we can hit our next button. That'll take us to the upper right. That means we're grabbing a strand from the upper left carrying it around the back under one over under over under over under over we're gonna do this for a few more times here always remembering to hit the next button grabbing a strand from the upper right around the back Now right now it's really easy to, fairly easy to distinguish between the strands. Later on, when we keep on constructing this pattern, it's going to get a little challenging, meaning that there's going to be strands. Long story short, strands will tend to overlap each other later on, and you have to watch out for that. So next. Under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over. And notice, yeah, this is still sliding around a lot. We'll, we'll pick that up a little bit, a little bit later on. Right now we're just worrying about establishing a correct diamond plat. Next. Same thing again. Like I said, it's going to be like this for a few passes. Under, over, under, over, under, over. So we can see the diamond pattern is starting to materialize there. Already some of my gray strands are wanting to twist on me a little bit there. It's kind of annoying. Every time I'm just pulling them out, getting the twist out of them. Can shimmy this up to the top now, I think. And next, same thing again. Under, over, under, over. And I tell you what, guys, you will really learn to appreciate a standard herringbone after you go through with this pattern because you will be able to fly through like you wouldn't believe so 
if you ever feel like whip making is taking a while, we'll go next, now we're on the left side. If you ever feel like whip making is, is taking a very long time, especially on your thongs, do some fancy plaiting for a while. And it'll kind of give you a whole new perspective of it. This fancy plaiting definitely presents the opportunity to learn patience. And next. Under, over. Under, over, under. It's very difficult to do this around the camera. I apologize if I'm going slower than I normally do. And next, almost out, almost out of the pure diamond pattern, you'll, you'll notice that the, the last few strands will start to do funny things, and that means we're starting to get into our stair steps or bands that we looked at earlier. And next. This is the last strand that is going to be doing a, a solid under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over. Because all the ones from this point on next, the next strands, are going to be integrating into the pattern. And you'll, you'll see what I mean by that in one second. Next, see that? The last one is under two. So it's basically, you're starting with a diamond pattern and it just starts to do odd things. So, under, over, under, over, under, over one, and under those last two. And this is what it looks like while we're entering a band of red red band and next red this red from the upper left and we're gonna go under one over one under one over one under one over three just like that So you can see the, the top of the band is starting to come together there. See that? Top of the red band. Keep on going. Next. Grabbing a strand from around the back. Under one. Over one. Under one. Over one under three, one, two, three, and over the last one. Like that. And next, grabbing a strand from the upper left. Under one, over, under, over three, count them out, one, two, three, and under the last two strands. And I'm going to move everything up a little bit because the clamp I'm using is starting to get in my way. Don't worry, I'll reposition the camera for you. Now, as the pattern continues to get more complicated as we work our way down and get out of this diamond pattern altogether, strands are going to want to cross on each other. We really have to be conscious of that and recognize what strand, which strand is which. Next. And we're going 
under one, over one, under three, count them out, one, two, three, over the last three. And here we can see we're working on the gray band now. That gray stair step is starting to materialize there. And let's go to the next step. Grabbing a strand from the upper left. And we're gonna go under one, over three, one, two, three. Notice I'm pulling the strands to make sure they are who they really say they are. Um, anyways, under one, over these three, under the next three, and over the last one. Just like that. And let's go next. Under three, over three, under two. Not too bad. Under three, one, two, three. Under three, over three, one, two, three. Under two. And next. Over two, under three, over three. One, two, and before I go over or under these strands, I pull them to make sure that they move up here. The top strand should be the top strand, meaning that I pull it, I need to see evidence that that is the correct strand. Otherwise, it's crossed over. Sometimes you'll pull a strand and the one down here will move, and that means that unfortunately, along the road, you have crossed a strand over and you need to go back. Anyways, over two, under three, one, two, three, and over the last three, like that. So now we're working on the third band, which is in red, and then we'll be diving into the main, uh, the main, the center of the pattern, as it, as it were. Next, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit for you guys. And let's grab that strand on the upper right. Under one, over three, under three, over one. Just like that. And next. We're gonna go under three, over three, one, two, three, under one, and over the last one. Notice the strand is wanting to cross. This red one that we're pulling is dragging this one over. Push it back into its place. Tell it who's boss. And there we go, let's go next. Grabbing a strand from the upper right, a gray strand, we're gonna go over the first two strands. I'm pulling them to make sure that they are the correct strands. Good, but I'm seeing evidence because they're moving up here in the correct orientation, so we're over two. Under three, one, two, three. Over two, one, two, and under that last one. Just like that. And pulling all of them into place, making sure that I have a nice 45 degree angle on all of my strands. And let's click next. Grabbing a strand from the upper left. All it is is a left right orient uh, left right alternating going on. Under one, over these three, 
under two, and over the last two. Next sequence is a simple one, under three over five. One, two, three, under three over five. Now when we take a strand and we go over five, we have to keep in mind that this strand is gonna be moving around a lot because it's only pinned down it's pinned down very far at far points from each other. So if it's pinned here and pinned here by another red strand, this is going to be moving around a little bit. We have to watch out for that. It's going to try to move and we have to make sure it stays in its track. And that will be uh, more clear later on. I'll show you what I mean by that. Under three over five that was. So now we go next. Grabbing a strand from the upper left. We're going to go over these two, under five, count them out, one, two, three, four, five, under five, and over that last one, just like that. Very good, and now we can click next, scroll down a bit, grabbing a strand from the upper right around the back, we're going to go under one, over three, one, two, three, under three, and over one. And next, under three, over three, under one, over one. back. One, two, three, under three, over three, one, two, three, under one, and over the last one, like that. And now we got that strand trying to cross again, put it back where it needs to be. Very good. And move everything up a little bit again, just because it's starting to get inconvenient again there we are and next it's a little longer sequence longer than we've had in a little while and we're going to go around the back we're going to go under two over one under one over one under one over one and under the last one, just like that. And then I'm just pulling the strands out from underneath each other, every pass like that, to make sure they're where they need to be. And let's go next. Pretty much the inverse here. We're gonna take this, take this strand around the back, and we're going to go over one, under one, over one, under one, over one, under one, and over the last two strands. Just like that. And let's go next. Grabbing that strand from the upper right side around the back, we're going to go under one, over one, under one, over one, under three, one, two, three, and over the last three, just like that. good let's go next under one over three so under this one over the next three one two three over the three under three 
one, two, three, and over the last one, like that. And next, under one, over five, under two. Grab that strand from the upper right side. Make sure it's the right one, it is. Under one, over the next five, one, two, three, four, five, over those, and under the last two strands. Pull those strands in place like that. Just kind of going through and giving all of these a little tug. Make sure they're not sliding around all over the place and confusing me. I'll speak for myself because they definitely have a way of confusing me. Let's go next. Under five, over three. Simple enough, right? Around the back. One, two, three, four, five. Under five, over those last three strands like that. And there we go. Notice here, this strand is kind of buried underneath there. We have to make sure that strands are not covering other strands. And the primary way that strands will cover other strands is if your angle is too shallow. You have to maintain that 45 degrees. And it really helps things fall into place. And let's go next. Under two, over two, under three, over one. Grab a strand from the top right side, around the back. Under two, over two. Yep, those are them. Under three, under three, and over that last strand, like that. And we can see we're slowly departing from the center of the pattern. We're actually getting into the stair steps now at the bottom. You'll notice that when you're working your way through the patterns, the next one slowly starts to reveal itself little by little until finally it's dominating every sequence. So now around the back, we're gonna go over one, under two, over three, one, two, three, and under two. So I messed up. This is correct. I messed up. I went over those strands. I should have gone under. Uh, proceed on course, and your, your pattern will end up looking fine. But I made a mistake there. And now we will go next. Go around the back. Grab the strand from the upper right. It's going to be under one. Over one, under three, one, two, three. And over the remaining three. Just like that. And next. Grabbing a strand from the upper left, a red one around the back. Under one, over three. Under three, over the last one. Making sure the angles are all correct and those strands are covered covering other strands and now let's go next under three over three under two around the back one, two, three. So under 
under 3, over 3, and under the last 2. Now you can see we are covering that pattern there. We're working on the second gray stair step here. Next. Now we're over two, under three, over three. So over one, two, over those strands, under the next three, and over the remaining three. Let's go next. Scroll down for you guys. Under one, over three, under three, over one. Under one over three. Under three over one. And next. Under three over three. One, two, three. Count those strands out, give them a tug to make sure they are who they say they are. Taking that red strand and we're going under three, over three, over these three, under one, and over the last one. I can't stress enough, take your time on this pattern. Next, so back over to the left side, you'll notice that things are starting to resemble a diamond pattern again and we're slowly breaking back into a diamond pattern. So with every pass, you'll notice that it slowly starts to move back in, basically. Grabbing a strand from the upper right around the back side. We're gonna go over two, under three, one, two, three, over one, under one, and over the last one, like that. And the diamond pattern is coming back. So glad it is. Next. Grabbing a strand from the upper left, around the back. Under one. Over three. One, two, three. Under one. Over one. Under one. Over one. And next. Grabbing a strand from the upper right around the back, we're going to go under three, one, two, three, and over one, under one, over one, under one, over one. So slowly but surely, every pass, that diamond pattern is making its way back into the pattern, and pretty soon it will be dominating the whole handle again. Let's go next. You just slowly see it creep up a little more and a little a little more every time. Over two. Under one, over one, under one, over one, under one, over one. So we're almost finished with this pattern. And next. And now we're back into it, guys. Finally, we're back into a pure diamond pattern. Just how we started. Around the back. Under one, over one, under one, over one. Under one, over one, under one, over one. And we can finish out this handle in the diamond pattern. So there it is. That's what we've done. And there's no need to have the diamond pattern on the screen. 
to finish it out. So we'll go ahead and close that up. But let's go ahead and finish this handle in a diamond plat. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show me doing that. We're just going to keep doing under over, under over, under over, under over, all the way until we get to the transition of this whip. I'm going to tie this thing off. It's going to be a multicolored handled. It's going to be an off-color handled whip, and uh, we'll continue there. So something that's really important to remember is make sure you give your pattern a heavy roll. So here's a view of the handle before I rolled it. As you can see, all of the little edges are kind of uh, peeling up. Uh, the, the pattern is not by any means flat. So a lot of times with fancy plaiting, you have strands bending in different ways. And some of those strands don't want to do what they're doing, meaning that you can really see the edges and the folds. So make sure you give it a hefty roll it'll make the pattern a lot more visible and it'll just make things look a whole lot cleaner so here is a view after the roll and you can just see how everything is just laying down so much better and the pattern is just that much more visible well this whip is now complete as you can see i've added a couple of knots i've added a two pass nine by eight at the heel. One pass was in 550 parachute cord and the other pass was in 95 cord. So a video is coming up on this fairly shortly. And I did something very similar for the transition knot. I also waxed the whip and this thing is ready to go. So I wanna talk about a few things in hindsight. Uh, there's kind of three things that I wrote down here, three notes that uh, I, uh, I, I really wanted to discuss and kind of debrief here. So first of all, I want to talk about how sometimes uh, part of the pattern can look like gaps, meaning that when we were working through here, I, I noticed some what appeared to be spaces. And naturally, when, when you are plaiting a whip, you'll see that space and you'll think to yourself, wow, I, I want to close that up. I want to push those two strands together to cover that up. Well, that's not always the case. In this case, sometimes those spaces were necessary and they were actually part of the pattern. So don't be qu too quick to uh, look at one of those patterns and dismiss it as a problem. Um, work through it a little bit. See what things are looking like uh, as, as you're plaiting because sometimes those spaces, a lot of the times those spaces uh, are actually necessary parts of that pattern that you planned out. Number two, the longer a strand is, on the surface, uh, especially going over. There were some spots where we were going over five. Uh, the more strands that you're going over, the more free that strand is going to be, meaning that it's gonna move around on you a lot. We have these gray strands, as you can see, they're going over. Some of them are going one, two, three, four, over five strands. And uh, before you have it tacked down there where that red is, uh, this strand here is just moving all over the place, sliding and it can be very tricky. So it might be a good idea if you're starting out with fancy plaiting to not have too many uh, strands that you're going over at one time. Lastly, what I noticed when I was doing this handle is you're so used to seeing your blueprint that you make on face plat, when you're actually plaiting your pattern, it looks different because you don't actually see all of those lines. It's not a grid. Um, so that's something uh, that you also have to recognize. Well guys, thank you so much for stopping by and watching this tutorial. I want you all to know something. I could not have made this video, nor could I have gotten into fancy plaiting as easily as I did if it weren't for Mike Icon creating face plat. So go show some love and appreciation to Mike. Go up to the upper left corner and click on that donate button. Guys, a program like this isn't something you can just sit back, relax, on a Saturday afternoon and just crank out in two hours. A website like this is sophisticated. It takes hours upon hours of work, commitment, and maintenance. He's helped more people than he probably knows getting started in fancy plaiting. So personal thank you, Mike Icon. Thank you, my friend. You made fancy plaiting really an enjoyable thing to learn. Let's take this whip outside and end the video with a few test cracks.